Welcome to Fall 2020 More Than The Score virtual talk series. We have over 600 More Than The Score fans that registered for this program. There are alumni, parents, students, and friends from 32 states and five foreign countries. Wow, we have a big audience today. We're fortunate to have Kelsey Johnson for this virtual talk on what if we are alone in the universe. Hi, I'm Althea Brooks and I'm Senior Director of Lifetime Learning in the University of Virginia's Office of Engagement. Please allow me to introduce our speaker for this program, Kelsey Johnson. Kelsey is a professor of astronomy and the director of the ECHO Scholars Program at the University of Virginia. She is the president of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and sits on the American Astronomical Society board. In November 2019, Kelsey gave a widely viewed TED Talk, The Problem of Light Pollution. This is on the importance of dark skies. Kelsey's TED Talk has been viewed over 1.9 million times. We've added the link to, the to our TED Talk in the chat box for you. Kelsey created Dark Skies Bright Kids, an award-winning volunteer program designed to enhance sci science education in the Virginia elementary schools. This program helps students explore the universe and develop curiosity. Kelsey is a well-published uh, faculty here at UVA. Her work appears in the American, uh, I'm sorry, in the Scientific American, the Washington Post, the New York Times, Mrs. Magazine, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. Kelsey is an author of a recently released book entitled Constellations for Kids, an easy guide to discovering the stars. The book introduces stargazing to young readers. Kelsey teaches a course on unsolved mysteries of the universe. A former student of Kelsey who's registered for this program today is quoted as saying, this was the best class I have taken. Audience, I believe we are in for an educational treat today. Again, thank you for being with us. We received your questions in advance of this program. Should you have another question during the program, please add it to the chat box and Kelsey will do her best to answer as many of your questions as time permits. Now, please help me welcome Kelsey Johnson to share with us today. Kelsey, the microphone's all yours. <laughs> oh, thank you, Althea. I, you know, I imagine that some of the folks who have called in today might be a little bit concerned or worried about there being a faculty member who is going to legitimately talk about extraterrestrial life, but, Happy Halloween, and I hope it is a treat for you. I also want to acknowledge Althea's uh, amazing background. I hope some of you have had a chance to hear a little bit about the, um, the activities going on in the rotunda. So um, before we start, I want to ask you to indulge me just a tiny bit. Um, and I'm going to ask you to do something that might feel a bit silly, but I hope that you'll do it anyway. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to while your eyes are closed, envision what comes to mind when I say the word extraterrestrial life. So I'm just gonna give you a minute to do that while I get my screen sharing going. Um, again, think about extraterrestrial life. What is What comes to mind when you think about that? Now, I'm gonna go out on a limb and, um, okay, you can open your eyes now if you want. <laughs> Although, honestly, all I have up in front of you is a black blank screen, um, so you can still be imagining what you think extraterrestrial life is. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, um, for, for most people, if, if you are a normal human being, uh, when you envision extraterrestrial life, um, probably you envision something that's actually roughly humanoid. I mean, maybe it has uh, two heads or eight arms or green skin but it's probably roughly humanoid. And I want you to, to pause and think about that for a minute. Um, a lot of this is actually due to Hollywood. Thanks Hollywood and the visualizations they have given us through the years. But um, it's also incredibly myopic. If we think about other kinds of life, even just in our own biosphere, you know, on our own planet, 
um, that have come about. So I want to introduce you to a couple of a couple of the ones that give me pause. Um, let's see. So here we have, um, this is one of my favorites. This is a Dumbo, uh, a Dumbo octopus, um, lives in the deep ocean. I think if I were to see this in the deep sea, I would, I probably wouldn't want to run away screaming. I might even want to go up and cuddle it. It doesn't seem um, to my human eye to be that threatening. We also have, um, this is the, oh, this beauty, look at this. Wouldn't you love to see this like just floating around the cosmos? I think if I were in space and I saw this floating around, I would, um, I would probably just be mesmerized and want to watch it um, for some time. Or we have um, this one, <laughs> this amphipod. Um, this is also a deep sea critter. Now, if I came across this in space, I, I don't think I would want to cuddle it. I think I might actually want to run away um, the other direction and quickly get back into whatever um, habitat or safe, safe space that I might have available to me. But the point is um, that all of these critters are examples of life on our own planet with the same sort of chemical makeup, the same gravity, orbiting the same star with the same light source. And so when we think about extraterrestrial life, we need to think a lot more broadly, I think, than we often do. Um, and so if you did envision something roughly humanoid or even like this amphipod that I'm showing you now, um, I want to encourage you to think more broadly. Um, we have no idea what life in the universe could be like. And it's easy to assume that it might be like life on Earth, but we don't actually know that to be true. So I want to tell you a couple things that we know about life on Earth that I think are actually incredibly important when we put them together. Um, the first is that wherever we look on Earth, when we see liquid water, we find life. This is actually incredibly remarkable. And one of the things this tells us is that um, it looks like water really might be the most important thing for creating life in the universe. Now, we don't actually know that for a fact. Um, there could be other kinds of liquid that could give rise to life. For example, we think about liquid methane, and there are critters on Earth that seem to do fine with lots of liquid methane. So it could be other liquids are possible. But the point is, um, everywhere we find liquid water, we find signs of life. The other thing that we know about life on Earth is that as soon as it possibly could have life emerged on Earth. Um, now, let me un unpack what I mean by that just a little bit. The early solar system, so just when the planets um, were first forming and the debris was starting to settle around the sun, the early solar system was a nasty, inhospitable place. It was chaotic. There were huge chunks of rock flying around. And by huge, I mean the size of planets. Um, it, it would not have been a great time for life to be around. So the early solar system was really, really nasty. And um, during this time period, which we call, um, this is a little bit of a jargon, but we call it the period of late heavy bombardment um, because it was just you know, stuff flying into earth all the time. Um, as soon as this period of late heavy bombardment stopped, we see evidence of fossilized life on earth. Now, it could even be that life had emerged on Earth many times before the period of late heavy bombardment ended, but as soon as it got going, it was wiped out because something smashed into us. We don't know and we don't have a record of that because the Earth was, was actually resurfaced um, many times during that period in the solar system. But again, the point is, as soon as the solar system was hospitable to life, we see evidence that life formed. So these two things taken together suggest, and again, they don't, they don't prove, but they suggest based on our experience of one, that um, life is not super hard to form uh, if you have the right conditions. And one of those right conditions is that you need water. Now you might ask, okay, we're thinking about the whole galaxy. Um, what about even just in our solar system? So if all we need uh, are conditions that are hospitable and water, 
um, and life is pretty easy to form, there are already places in our solar system that we might look. Uh, so for example, this is, um, some of you may recognize this is the planet Mars. We are pretty sure that at some point in Mars history, it had liquid water on the surface. It may still have liquid water under the surface. We don't know the answer to that. Um, so Mars is certainly an active place where we're looking um, for evidence that there may have at some point been um, some form of microbial life. Uh, this is the surface of uh, the moon Europa, which orbits uh, uh, Jupiter. Europa is actually covered in a, a crust of ice, but um, we believe that under this crust of ice, there's actually a subsurface ocean. And this is the moon of Saturn. This moon is named Enceladus. And um, Enceladus is pretty awesome uh, because what you can see, see here is that Enceladus actually has liquid water um, that comes out in the form of geysers. So the reason I'm showing you these is to say that even in our solar system, around this one star in the, in the galaxy, in the universe, there are several places in which it could have at some point been possible um, for life to get going. Now, I'm gonna throw some numbers at you. It, um, it may surprise you to know that we can think about this scientifically. And to do this, we use, uh, we use an equation, it's called the, the Drake equation, and I'm going to spare you the details of this. But to use the Drake equation, um, we have to make some assumptions, and we also have to know some things. But one of the things we need to know, I mean, ultimately, we want to know how many times could life have evolved in the galaxy, and how much life could there be out there? Well, the first question we want to ask is, how many stars in the galaxy could um, have the right conditions to have some kind of life around them? And the answer to that is, oh, roughly 10 billion, give or take, right? I'm an astronomer, so um, we don't have incredibly high precision on the numbers we use sometimes, but roughly 10, 10 billion stars just in our single galaxy that could have conditions that are okay for life. Um, but let's say that um, let's say that not all of those are great for life, and that um, you know uh, maybe maybe we've overcounted in some way. Maybe maybe some of them are in environmental conditions that just make it wrong. So let's say maybe we've we've um, we've highballed that a little bit. So let's um, let's take that down, and let's say that maybe maybe a whole only um, hundred million of those 10, 10 billion have liquid water. Um, but maybe of those 100 million that have liquid water, maybe um, life has only arisen on those. Maybe life is actually a lot harder to get going than we thought it was. You know, we see evidence on Earth in our statistical sample of one that life got going pretty quickly. But what if we're wrong? Um, and so what if life is actually harder to get going than we thought? Um, so maybe it's, it's actually, you know, 100 times harder to get going than we thought. So maybe only 1 million of those 100 million planets um, happens to have life ever have gotten going on it. Um, so our numbers are going down pretty fast. But now we have a real big question. All right, let's say life got going on one of these planets. And, and in all statistical likelihood, it's probably sort of very microscopic, very primordial. How do we know that that life is going to evolve to become intelligent? And the fact is we don't. It depends a lot on assumptions we make about intelligence and the survival value it has. Uh, but let's say of those 1 million potential solar systems that could have some kind of life at some point, um, let's say that, um, I don't know, maybe only a thousand of those evolve to become something we would consider intelligent or something we would consider to be technologically advanced. So we've take we started with a very large number that I think is hard for many people to visualize. I mean, I don't know if you can visualize 10 billion. I know that I have trouble visualizing 10 billion and I think about big numbers all the time. And and we've I've tried to lowball a lot of these estimates to say what if our assumptions are wrong and we're off by a factor of 100? What if our assumption is wrong and we're off by a factor of 1000? And these are crude guesses and I will be the first one to admit it because we don't have hard numbers and so we have to make estimates and we have to make our educated best guesses about what the boundary conditions on these numbers might be. So now we're down to 1000 life forms 
that at some point in the Milky Way's history and our galaxy's history have evolved to become intelligent and technologi technologically advanced. Okay, I wanna pause on this for a minute and um, think about our galaxy, which has had roughly a 10 billion year history. Our galaxy has been around roughly that long. And let's say that these thousand life forms that have evolved have been sort of randomly spaced in those in that 10 billion year history. Um, that means that between the dawn of each one of these civilizations, it's been about 10 million years on average. Let that sink in, because what that means is that statistically, on average, we would expect the next oldest uh, civilization before us, so our closest galactic big sibling, so our big brother, our big sister in the galaxy that was just above us in the pecking order, on average, we might expect them to be 10 million years more advanced than we are. Um, and I hope that that gives you pause to think about if we were to make it as a species for another 10 million years, um, how much might we advance? How much might we evolve? Um, for a little bit of context, I wanna point out that we have only been bipedal walking on two feet for a, a, a few million years. Um, and so we've, we've blown past a huge amount of human evolution if we can make it to 10 million years. Uh, so I think that that, I think that statistic itself is a little bit jarring. In terms of the history of the galaxy, if there is other life, statistically speaking, we are likely to be the infants. We are very much the babies in the galactic civilization. And I think it is um, important maybe to be mindful of that uh, when we're thinking about the cosmos and our role in it. Now, let's put this in context though, because the galaxy is a really big place. Um, so here I am signposting roughly the location of the sun in um, a cartoon version of a spiral galaxy. I'll just point out gently as an aside that uh, we've never left our galaxy to take a picture of it. So if anyone ever tells you they're showing you a picture of our galaxy, they're not really because we can't do that yet. Uh, but this is roughly the location of our sun um, in a galaxy um, that I'm envisioning for you looks something like our own. And um, you'll note that one of the things, our sun is kind of out in the suburbs. Um, it's not in any particularly interesting location. Um, no offense to those of you who live in the suburbs. I mean that with um, the most possible love that I can send to you. Um, but this is the location of our sun in the galaxy. And um, in terms of our sun, even the next closest star to us is about four light years away. What that means is that um, even if we sent a light signal to the next closest star, it would take four light years for that signal to get there. And it would take four years for us to get a reply message from them. That is assuming that they wrote back right away. I mean, maybe they were trying to play it cool and not answer. Um, so that's a long time. And it's not as if, you know, if we want to travel out and about in the galaxy, it's not as if we can even, even travel close to the speed of light, at least not yet. Now think about those, you know, the number of a thousand civilizations over the lifetime of the galaxy, um, imagine those distributed about this image. What that would mean is that on, again, statistically on average, the next closest um, birthplace of a civilization would be about 10,000 light years away. Meaning that if you had a spaceship that traveled at the speed of light, it would take you 10,000 years to get there. And again, of course, we can't travel at the speed of light, at least not yet. And I want to make a couple quick points here for context. I think it's really easy for us as humans to lose sight of things that have happened outside of our lifetimes. Um, but for context here, I think this is really important. So 100 years ago, um, and I'm I'm guessing, um, it, it, I would be thrilled if we have anyone who online who was here 100 years ago, that would be really cool. And Althea, I hope you can find out. Um, but 100 years ago, um, we were just inventing airplanes. And now we are, we have spaceships. 
Um, so think about how much that technology has come come along in just a hundred years. And now imagine what that technology might look like, not just another hundred years from now. I think that maybe we can envision another hundred years from now, what that technology might look like. But if a thousand years from now, or 10,000 years from now, or 10 million years from now, which is again, statistically the next oldest galactic civilization. Um, I know, and you know, I live and breathe this world as an astrophysicist and I cannot fathom the technology we might have access to in 10 million years if we're still around. And so I think um, it is tempting to dismiss that travel between the stars, it, you know, borders on impossible, but I wanna caution ourselves against being too close-minded about this because technology can advance a lot faster than I think um, we are aware uh, because our lifetimes are so short and 10 million years is really a very long time. Okay, but let's say, let's say we get the technology, let's say we're able to travel not at the speed of light because I don't think, well, I don't wanna ever say never because whenever a scientist says never, then they're proven wrong and it's really embarrassing. Um, but, but let's say that we at some point are able to travel close to the speed of light um, and that we've learned better how to manipulate the fabric of space and time. And maybe we have something like a, a warp drive that you may have seen in Star Trek. I mean. Who knows what might happen in 10 million years. So let's say that we can travel close to the speed of light and we could get to that next closest civilization and we could do it in 10,000 years. Okay, well, in, this, in, this, in the scheme of the galaxy, 10,000 years doesn't seem like a lot, but in the, you know, in the scope of a human lifetime, it certainly does. Um, I can't imagine that anyone logging on, <laughs> listening to me talk now is 10,000 years old. But if you are, please do let me know because that would make you somewhat of a medical miracle. But again, I want to um, come back to just a little bit of caution and think about where we are in terms of our understanding of human physiology and human lifespans and remind you that just a hundred years ago, which is just outside of a generation, we didn't even have penicillin, right? And look at where we are now. Um, and so to my mind, it isn't crazy to think that in not just another hundred years or a thousand years, but in 10 million years, would we have developed the technology to go into some kind of stasis or um, you know, a cryptobiotic state, enabling us to basically go to sleep, travel for 10,000 years and wake up feeling nice and refreshed like we'd had a good nap. I don't, I don't think that that is entirely crazy and um, certainly within the realm of possibility. So that is to say all of this, and I think you can probably read this, um, I don't think that traveling about the galaxy is a crazy idea within the next 10 million years. And I think if we survive that long, I think probably we will have done it. So I wanna show you an example of one of my favorite critters. Um, some of you may, may recognize this. This is not the most flattering rendition, um, but it does show a lot of detail. This is, uh, this is a water bear, also known as a tardigrade. Um, but thinking about human physiology and what might be required to go into a cryptobiotic state um, or to go into stasis and be in suspended animation for, for a very long time, we already know of critters in our own biosphere that have, um, that have the physiologic, physiological ability to do that. And one of them is this, this tardigrade, this water bear, um, which are just phenomenal creatures. And in fact, um, if you happen to live somewhere with moss or lichen um, around, around where you live, you might even be able to find some in your own backyard um, and, and look at them under a microscope, which is pretty astounding. Okay, so I wanna put forward to you a scenario. Um, 10 million years have gone by perhaps, um, maybe not even that, maybe, who needs 10 million? Let's go with 100. 100 years have gone by. Um, we've become technologically advanced. Um, by our definition of technologically advanced, uh, and there's a reason we use this, and I'm happy to go into it in the Q&A if people want to know the details, but um, from an astrophysics standpoint, we consider being technologically advanced when a civilization has the ability to communicate with radio wavelengths through the galaxy. Again, I'm not gonna go into the details on that. Um, but let's say um, 
uh, civilization has become technologically advanced. And that has been true of us for about 100 years, give or take. So we've become technologically advanced. And during that time, um, you know, our population is doing things. We're, we're, we're growing, um, we're becoming curious, we're natural explorers. So at some point during our evolution, we might just, um, we might run out of resources or be getting low on resources. It might be that we just want to know what else is out there in the universe. Um, it could be social strife, it could be religious persecution, but something drives the population to seek a new home. Um, and to find another place to live with new resources or new freedoms or, or lack of persecution. So um, subsets of the population go on to migrate. They migrate to another planet. Um, presumably they're gonna go to planets relatively nearby because that would be the most sensible thing to do, but who knows whether or not the things we see as logical with our human brains are actually logical in the scheme of the cosmos. <clears throat> so we go to a new planet. Uh, and then we start over again, right? We land on a new planet, we get our the infrastructure in place, we become technologically advanced, our population grows, um, we become curious, we deplete our resources, there's religious strife, um, and we rinse and repeat, right? There's there's any number of times that you could you could go through this cycle. Um, so if you go through this cycle, you could imagine going through this entire cycle in roughly ten thousand years. Um, it basically turns out to be the travel time between planets is the, is the, is the limiting factor here. Um, so it might look like this. Um, so I'm showing you here a graphic of a bunch of stars and you might imagine that um, we started, perhaps this, the star in the very center is the sun. And that's where the civilization started was in a planet around, in an orbit around the star at the very center. And, um, Whatever happened, they decided they needed to go migrate out into, into the galaxy. So the population sends out a couple subsets and they those populations go and inhabit the other nearest stars. And we rinse and repeat, right? So the population grows and they go and they, sub, they, they send subsets or exhibition parties out to other solar systems. And um, over time, this keeps happening over and over and over again. Um, if this scenario holds out, um, it turns out that even that one population, all it would take was this one initial um, intelligent, technologically advanced population around a single star could have populated the entire galaxy thousands of times over um, in the lifetime of the galaxy. Now, let me, I want, I want to hover on that point for a minute. Only one, one technologically advanced society needs to do this, needs to go through the process of colonizing other solar systems and then jumping off from there and star hopping and colonizing other solar systems. And the galaxy will have been colonized by extraterrestrial life forms hundreds or thousands of times over. Yet um, demonstrably, uh, we don't see that. And that leads us to um, what has been called Fermi's paradox. And uh, you may know the late Enrico Fermi was a famous physicist, and he was thinking about exactly this problem of, of, of time scales and, and likelihoods and um, how and all of the statistics of this. And he came to the realization that if any of our assumptions are remotely true, uh, and civilizations survive longer um, than say 10,000 years, they ought to have colonized the galaxy, but we don't see them. Um, so the question is, where are they? And um, there are some different families of questions uh, that, uh, that the answers could fall into. The first category is um, extraterrestrial life just doesn't exist. It could be that the assumption I put forward to you at the very beginning of this talk is just flat out wrong. Maybe life, you know, despite what we see on earth, maybe life is, is, is really rare. Um, it's really hard to get life going. Earth, it turns out, is an extraordinarily special place. And, um, and because of that, we shouldn't expect to see life elsewhere in the galaxy. And that could very well be the case. Um, if that is the case, 
the lesson I take from that and the lesson, I think one of the lessons I hope that you would take from that is that life on earth is extraordinarily precious because it is extraordinarily rare. So that's the first category of possibilities is it just doesn't exist um, because it's hard to get going. There's a whole second category of possibilities that might answer Fermi's paradox. And that set of possibilities has to do with um, either conspiracy theories uh, or our technological abilities. And that is maybe they do exist, extraterrestrial life does exist, but we either haven't seen it um, or we haven't acknowledged it. And it's hard for um, you know, civilians perhaps to know the difference. And um, I will say, I, I, I don't know, I, I, uh, let me be very clear. I don't have an inside track to, um, to high level clearance in the government. I, I don't know whether the government is actually hiding something that we don't know. Um, I, I will say that I would be incredibly surprised that information like that could possibly be kept secret and that scientists wouldn't know about it. Um, we're terribly, terribly bad about um, keeping things embargoed as scientists. Um, I could give you a recent example about that when it had to do with the possible detection of signs of life on Venus um, that was supposed to be embargoed, but pretty much the whole world knew about it before that story was released. So scientists are actually really bad at keeping information embargoed um, for better or worse. I think there might be pros and cons to that. Um, so I don't know, maybe the government is hiding something and somehow we've managed to keep that classified. I'm a little bit skeptical of that, but that doesn't mean it's not true. The other possibility in this category, though, is that we haven't seen it. And um, that could be, there could be a number of reasons for that. It could be that um, we don't, we're not looking in the right way, we're not looking in the right place. Um, it is kind of a needle in a haystack problem. Um, we have to make a lot of assumptions about where to look, how to look, what a sign of life would look like. Um, so there's that part of it, but the other part is we've only just started looking. Um, we've only surveyed um, you know, a very small set of the nearest stellar systems to the sun in the galaxy. So um, I, I certainly think we can't rule out that we haven't seen them. The other thing I would put forward though, is that um, if our next closest sibling in the galaxy is 10 million years more advanced than we are, and 10 million years, again, that's, that's a pretty long time to develop your technology. Um, I, I would put forward a conjecture to you that if they are 10 million years more advanced than we are at a minimum, um, if they don't want us to see them, I don't think we're gonna see them um, unless they make some sort of horrific rookie mistake. Um, I don't think that um, their technology, you know, I think they're gonna, I don't think it's crazy to think that there's some kind of a prime directive or some kind of a zoo hypothesis that there is extraordinarily advanced um, extraterrestrial life out there that knows we're here, but you know, what are we to them? We've barely even gotten off the ground. Um, we barely have anything in space. So they're probably, you know, if they're there and they're watching, they're probably just waiting to see what we do and whether we turn out to be uh, reasonable people who um, care about the universe, who knows? I mean, now we're into the realm of astropsychology, which is entirely untapped as far as I can tell. Okay, so that was the second category is, um, we just haven't seen them for whatever reason, or we haven't acknowledged them um, because of some kind of a conspiracy. The third category um, is one that actually gives me pause. And um, this is what really worries me and sometimes keeps me up at night. So let's say uh, the assumptions we made earlier on were, were not too bad. Let's say life is not so hard to get going. It has gotten going loads of times over the history of the galaxy. And, um, and it's evolved to become intelligent and technologically advanced. Um, we, we should have seen them, but maybe we, we haven't. Then we're faced with this issue of maybe they did exist, but they don't now. And what that calls to mind is the very, very sobering reality that it could be that whenever life gets going in the galaxy and it becomes intelligent and technologically advanced, it never survives long enough to go about colonizing the galaxy in the way the cartoon version of it that I proposed to you. Maybe they never survive 
past their first 10,000 years after they've become technologically advanced. Uh, so for example, we have by our admittedly provincial definition, only been technologically advanced for about 100 years. Um, think about how many times in that 100 years um, we could have even destroyed ourselves. So I think, for example, about the Cold War, when the, the whole deal with the Cold War was mutually assured annihilation. There are lots of other ways the universe could kill us too. Um, you know, certainly I think most people have at least seen movies about giant asteroids hitting Earth. Um, Statistically speaking, at some point, another giant asteroid will hit Earth. Um, I would suppose, you know, if it happens next year, we're in big trouble. But if it happens 10,000 years from now, um, I would like to think that, the, but that by that point, we would have the technological ability to do something about it. So I think if we are able to survive for 10,000 years from now, and have that kind of technological ability, there are things the universe could do to snuff out the planet, but I think we would be in a better place to protect ourselves against them. And so I think in that case, the real danger is us, is ourselves. Because now we are in what we call our technological adolescence. And what I mean by that, I don't know how many of you have ever had teenagers in your house, um, but with the technological adolescence, what it means is that you have developed the technology and you are smart enough to destroy yourself, but you're not wise enough not to. And for me, the takeaway point from this is really that we, um, we need to be mindful of this really precarious state we are at in our own evolution um, and, and not take that for granted. So I want to end with, um, this is one of my favorite pictures of, of all time. This is, uh, some of you may know it, this is a picture of Earth. Um, I hope that you might be able to see it. It's this little speck uh, right there. This is the picture of Earth that was taken um, by the Voyager satellite. Um, some of you may remember the Voyager satellites that launched in the 70s. When the Voyager satellite took this image, it, it, was, it was at the distance of Saturn. Um, it hadn't even left the solar system yet. And it, it turned around, the late Carl Sagan convinced um, NASA to take limited resources and turn the Voyager satellite around and take a picture of Earth so that we could see our place in the cosmos. Um, and, and get a sense of what humanity's role is. So this is a very famous image. It's called the pale blue dot. And uh, this is an image uh, I like to show my students whenever I get the chance, because I think it really helps to frame, to frame some of the questions we're thinking about and to frame our role as humanity. And so what I would like to do, um, Again, if you'll forgive me, I don't like I don't like reading from paper. It makes me really uncomfortable. But I want to share with you um, a beautiful excerpt from Carl Sagan's book, *The Pale Blue Dot*, that he wrote about this image. And there's no way I can memorize this, so I have to read it off of paper. So um, I also, if if you have heard this before, that's great. Um, you'll also know that hearing Carl read this in his own voice is actually incredibly magical. Um, so if you have the chance to actually listen to to the late Carl Sagan, read this in his own voice. I encourage you to do that. Okay, so this is the excerpt from the pale blue dot. From this distant vantage point, the earth might not seem of any particular interest, but for us, it's different. Consider again that dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, Everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forger, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth 
is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph, they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds, our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark and our obscurity in all this vastness. There is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The earth is the only world so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least not in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes. Settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Thank you. I appreciate your attention and I look forward to answering your questions. Kelsey, thank you so much. That was incredible. What an informative, engaging, out of this world talk for uh, Halloween Eve. So thank you. Kelsey, did you want to share a poll question um, at all? You don't have to. Oh, <laughs> let's, you know what? I would love to. Um, and I apologize that I forgot to, nope. I got so invested in what I was saying. I completely forgot that I wanted Which to pull the wonderful. audience. <laughs> Which was yeah, wonderful. Let's, Let's do it. Um, so let's go to the poll question number one. I would love to know how likely you think it is that there is other life in the universe. Give you you know a minute or two to pick a button and click it. I'm actually so I meant to ask you this question before I told you what I thought. Um, because I didn't want you to be biased, you know, from, from my perspective and what I told you, but I'm actually really curious now to know what you think after having heard me talk about this. Oh, pretty likely. <laughs> this is, this is a good range of answers. Um, I especially applaud the, the 3% of you that said you have no idea. Um, I think that is a, that is a very honest answer, um, given the state of affairs. That's fantastic. Okay, let's try um, poll number two. Um, and what I want to know in poll number two is, if we made contact with extraterrestrial life, how would you feel about that? And it could be that none of the none of the words I've chosen here are appropriate to you, or maybe all of them are appropriate to you. I think that more than one of them would would certainly um, fit me at the time. It may surprise you to know that there are actually groups doing research on this um, and trying to better understand um, how humans would react if we were contacted by extraterrestrial life. Because I think if, if that were to happen, you know, perhaps as unlikely as it might be, um, it would certainly be good for us to be prepared for um, what the human fallout might be. And the answer is, survey says, really? And okay, all right, 1% of you would feel relieved. I'm actually curious to know about that. Um, 41% would be excited. Not so many people would be scared. And I think that's really interesting. Um, I would love to talk to each of you individually and ask you like, why would you be excited or why would you be scared or not scared? But this forum doesn't allow it. So maybe we can have a conversation another time. And the last poll, I wanna know um, these different solutions to Fermi's paradox that I put before you. Um, which one of them do you think is most likely? And so we had the three categories, 
Um, one is that life is just much harder to get going than we think it might be. Um, the other category is that it's out there, we just haven't seen it, um, whether um, deliberately or not. And um, it and the most depressing one of, to my mind is it, it, it has existed, but it doesn't exist now because chances of surviving that long are, are pretty low. And of course, these aren't mutually exclusive, right? More than one of these could be true or it could be something else that we haven't thought of yet. And the answers are, hmm, I like it. I love that we're thinking about the different categories of possibilities, how it could be some combination. That is really fantastic. Thank you so much for giving me your feedback on those polls. I, I really appreciate it. It's the kind of thing that when you're teaching an in-person class is so much more fun because you get a sense of, of what folks are thinking when they're, they're listening to you talk. All right, over to you, Althea. You mean over to you. <laughs> more <laughs> questions. Questions have been flooding in. So I've got a few of them here for you that came in early, as well as uh, a few that came in doing your presentation. So let's see if we could get a few of these before our time ends today. Um, how is life defined for the purpose of searching for it from afar? Oh, gosh. Um, this, uh, this is a really good question because this is something we wrestle with a lot. Um, I don't know how many of you have a background in biology, but one of the things that we actually have a really hard time getting our head around is how you actually define life at all. Uh, and if this were a, a lecture in one of my classes, we would spend an entire class period talking about how you define life and why you define it that way. And the myriad ways in which any definition of life we have could turn out to just be wrong and how we might we might really need to throw any definitions we have out the window um, and life might not be what we think it should be. But in terms of detecting it from afar, um, it really has to do with technology. And there could be life of, of crazy forms throughout the galaxy, but unless we're able to technologically connect with them or see them, um, we're never gonna know they're there. So in that in that sense, defining life that we can interact with technically is actually a lot easier. And right now that that definition is quite narrow, um, which isn't to say it shouldn't be, be broadened, but right now that definition has to do with a civilization's ability to and willingness to um, transmit radio waves across the galaxy. And it's, it's really at this point quite limited to that. And that's one of our only abilities to try to detect it and know whether or not they're trying to communicate with us. Um, so again, I wanna acknowledge we're in our infancy. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, we've, we've received quite a few questions on UFOs. Do you wanna address that at all? You wanna talk about UFOs? <laughs> Of course, I want to talk about UFOs. Um, I don't know. Do people want to stay online until like five o'clock because we could talk for <laughs> a really long time? Um, UFOs are a really tricky thing, and um, one of the things I want to I want to remind folks right off the top is that UFO literally stands for unidentified flying object, which means it's unidentified. Now, by virtue of being unidentified, that means we don't know what it is. Um, and we can think about all the possibilities for what it might be. And I think the UFOs that really capture people's attention are the ones that we can't think of a good explanation for. And indeed, there are examples of, of UFOs um, for which we have not thought of a good explanation. The problem often with UFOs is that um, virtually all of the sightings that have been reported are not repeatable, right? There, there are things that happened and then, and, then they, and then they were done. And when something's not repeatable, especially if it doesn't leave any kind of evidence behind, uh, it, it makes it untestable. And so there's this real issue with the foundation of what it means to do science and the foundation of doing science means we have to be able to test a hypothesis. And if our hypothesis is that an unidentified flying object came from another world or another civilization, we have to be able to test that. And if we can't test it, we have no way to demonstrate the likelihood of whether that, that hypothesis is true or not. And so one of the things we're, we're 
you know, let me be clear right off the bat. I'm not, I'm not going to categorically say that all UFO sightings are bug. I don't know that. Um, I can't know that, nor can anyone, because most of them can't be tested. But I do also think that, um, you know, I think, I think a lot about likelihoods. And one of the dangers of thinking in terms of likelihoods is that likelihoods don't give you answers, they give you probabilities. And when I think about UFOs and likelihoods, um, I think, for example, is it more likely that an advanced civilization traveled across the galaxy because we caught their attention as some little, you know, baby slug on some little planet in, in the suburbs. They traveled across the galaxy to come and check us out and find out what they could, or perhaps even abduct us, but got here and crashed. Um, or they traveled across the galaxy for whatever motivation they have, um, and then let us see them. I, you know, and so I find those possibilities to be not impossible, but I find them to be improbable. Um, but the reality is in science, sometimes improbable things happen. And so I do think a lot about UFOs and I think a lot about what it would mean to test them and um, what kind of evidence we would need to convince ourselves that something that had been unidentified truly was from another civilization or whether it's something we just don't have the solution to. So is it more likely that a civilization traveled across the galaxy to come visit us or that say the military has some new jet that they're testing that we don't know about. And so um, those are the kinds of things that I wrestle with. And I don't know, you know, Althea, that was a broad question. What do I think about UFOs? I think a lot about UFOs, um, but I don't have any specific answers. Yeah, yeah. We, we get quite a few from, a, from many different angles, even, um, you know, what is it, um, the, the government, do, do you think the government, it's, government's hiding the conspiracy of UFOs? Um, Anyway, I think you've done enough on that. <laughs> Let's move on. Let's I don't know if anyone on. online in the government, they might know. <laughs> what about the Big Bang Theory? We, we've received quite a few questions about the Big Bang Theory. Um, oh. Is it so accepted that's a really, in the astronomy community? That is a really, that's a really good question, a great pivot. Um, Again, if this were, if any of you are so inclined to come take a class from me, we'll have a whole unit on the Big Bang. Um, the first thing I'll say is, is yes, the Big Bang is very much um, part of the mainstay of, of astrophysics. Um, but the other thing I want to say right on the heels of that is that there are pretty deep misconceptions about the Big Bang and what it is and what astronomers say it is among, among um, the population. And so let me say that, so the Big Bang is part of mainstay astronomy, but um, your understanding of the Big Bang might not be my understanding of the Big Bang. And so for example, um, let me zoom out a little bit. So again, as a scientist, um, I have to think very much about what is testable and what has evidence and what doesn't. And one of the things that is a very hard limit in science is that when we rewind the clock and we think about the history of the universe and whether it had an origin and what that origin might have be, might, might have been, we hit a very hard limit. Um, there is a special time. Some of you may have heard of the late physicist Max Planck. Um, he was one of the founders of quantum mechanics. And we have something called the Planck time, which is very, very, very small. It's 10 to the minus um, 43 seconds. I don't know if you can even envision how small that is. Like it's extraordinarily small. But when we hit the Planck time, we fundamentally don't understand the nature of time and space beyond that. And so when we talk about the Big Bang, what we mean is an era in the early universe during which um, the space time of the universe expanded rapidly. Um, what we don't mean is the, excuse me, the actual beginning of the universe, because we can't, and we have to acknowledge this as scientists, um, insofar as our understanding of quantum mechanics is correct, we cannot probe to time equals zero. But even if we could probe to time equals zero, which 
you know, at least according to our understanding of physics now, we can't. But even if we could, let's say I could tell you categorically that I know what caused the universe to come into existence, um, which is a slightly different, you'll notice that I said that slightly different than the Big Bang, because I think the universe coming into existence is not the same thing as the Big Bang. Let's say I could tell you what caused the universe to come into existence. Then your next question might be, well, what caused that cause that caused the universe to come into existence? And then what caused the cause that caused the universe to come into existence? And so we end up very, very quickly in an infinite regression. And it's, it's very hard to see our way out of that. It's troubling in terms of, of causality and physics. And it could be, by the way, that before the Big Bang, time didn't exist. We think, we think of time very much as part of the fabric of, of the universe. So it could be time didn't exist before the Big Bang, in which case causality is just straight out the window. How do you think about causality if you don't even have time? But we still end up, we end up in an infinite regression that is, that is physically and philosophically troubling. Um, but the Big Bang is a great topic. And um, again, I could, I could talk about till well past dinner time. Anyone want to go out for cocktails today? That'd be great. <laughs> Just kidding, we can't. <laughs> Not doing social distancing. Um, tons of questions. We're going to try to get two more in. Uh, can you provide any updates on the WOW message of 1977 and the follow-up research? Oh my gosh, how much do I love that um, someone in the audience knows about the WOW signal? That's really impressive. Um, let me... Uh, just unpack that a little bit for folks who don't happen to know about the wow signal. Um, so there was, um, in the 1970s, there was a big radio antenna. Um, I think it was in Ohio. And um, it was, uh, I'm gonna use the word listening, but um, it listening, mm, it's not actually listening. Radio light is light, even though we, we tend to say we're listening. So there's this big radio antenna. Um, it's monitoring space. It's monitoring just, you know, kind of a, you know, nowhere in particular in the galaxy. And um, it's recording the data and it, as it comes in. And I want to remind you, this is way back in the 70s, right? So I don't know if you you happen to have a computer in the 70s. I know I didn't have a computer until like well into the 90s. Um, but the computers in the 70s were very, very different. And so what happened was um, it was recording the strength of signals that were coming in. And um, so it was pretty much like zero, 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 zero. And then maybe there'd be some noise and it would go one or be a little bit more noise and it'd go one, two, one, and then back to zero. Um, and so it's doing this like strip chart, kind of, you know, think of it like an EKG, like a strip chart of the strength of the signal. And so it's, you know, bouncing around around zero. And then suddenly it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then it goes up through the alphabet, like up to like M or something. Um, and it was this incredibly strong signal. It came in very, very quickly. Um, but what was important about this signal was not only did, um, was it quite strong and, uh, and not identified, but more importantly, um, it also happened at exactly the right frequency um, that we think based on our own psychology that we think extraterrestrial life might want to communicate. Um, the problem with the signal is that people have gone back over and over again looking for it to repeat itself um, and, that, and, that, and it hasn't happened. We haven't caught it repeating itself. And so if it doesn't repeat itself, it's really hard for us to test. Um, there have been some other hypotheses that have been floated. So for example, um, there, was, there was a hypothesis that a comet that was unknown may have gone by um, that may have caused the signal that, that ended up not panning out. Um, but the bottom line is we still don't know what caused the wow signal. Um, but if it repeated someday, that would be pretty cool. My favorite theory, sorry, I'm, I'm big on favorite theories. Well, okay, this is a little bit grim, but it is almost Halloween. Um, I like, I don't like to think, but um, a hypothesis I find really intriguing is that the wow signal was the last gasp SOS signal from a civilization on the verge of destruction. It was like, we're gonna send this one Hail Mary out into the universe and say, hey, um, if anyone's listening, watch out because we're about to die. And then it went silent, but that's kind of grim and I have no way to prove that. So um, I just think it's fun to think about. All right, can you answer this last question really quickly? Uh, what about the universe expanding? Do you think the universe is expanding? Oh, what a great question. Yes, um, the universe, this is a good one. The universe is expanding. Um, we, have, um, we have been able to measure this 
for um, several decades now, many decades, actually since Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope is actually named after Edwin Hubble who discovered that the universe was expanding. Um, worse than that, so the universe is expanding and I know some of you might then be asking, well, what if it's, what is it expanding into? And that's a whole other question we can talk about hyperdimensions, but um, I don't think we have time to talk about hyperdimensions today, Althea, you're the judge of that. Um, <laughs> but what's, what's more interesting than Sorry, I don't. I want to. Don't want to belittle the fact that the universe is expanding. That's actually mind-bogglingly amazing. But what's even weirder than the universe expanding is that it's not just expanding. That expansion is accelerating. Um, it's actually expanding faster and faster and faster with time. And um, this is something that you may have heard of in astronomy called dark energy. Um, and in, in this in this case, dark is just code for we have no idea what it is and we can't see it, so we're going to call it dark. Um, there are a couple hypotheses on the table for what the dark energy might be and what is causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate, but we don't actually know. And this is one of the greatest unsolved mysteries in the universe right now. Wow. Wow. That's scary, <laughs> but exciting, right? <laughs> Um, it is exciting until you fast forward to the death of the universe and what it would mean and how it would rip apart molecules and atoms and planets. But, you know, that's a long time from now and we have some other problems we have to get through first. Kelsey, thank you so much. Thank you for spending an hour with us today. Uh, we went over just a little bit, but um, forgive us. And thank you. Come back again and, and share with us, okay? Audience, I that. hope you enjoyed that great talk by Kelsey Johnson. Incredible. Uh, we have quite a few programs coming up um, with Lifetime Learning for November. Uh, November 6, more than the score, we will host two Darden faculty members to discuss leading racial equity, inclusion, diversity at work. Uh, please join us for that talk. On November 9th, uh, the 2020 Center for Global Health Equity uh, Scholars Research Symposium. Please join us as an evening talk, a panel discussion. On November 11th, from green to gold, let's talk about the ginkgo trees at Blandy Farm. If you've never been out to Blandy, please join us for this talk. And on November 13th, a force for change, a century of women faculty at UVA. This will be a great panel discussion of uh, UVA faculty uh, speaking about kind of past life at UVA for, um, for women being at UVA. Um, please join us. A list of all of the lifetime learning programs are on our website at alumni.virginia.edu learn. Audience, please be safe and stay healthy. Enjoy your weekend. And again, Kelsey, thank you for joining us today.